Our friend. Called uh, December 10th, 2018, USD 350 Board of Education meeting to order. I'd like to welcome all our visitors. We have quite a gallery tonight. <laughs> Uh, any additions or changes to the agenda? I have none. Entertain a motion to approve the agenda. Mr. President, I move the board approve the agenda as presented. Second. Move and second the board approve the agenda as presented. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, nay. <coughs> motion carried 6 0. The consent agenda, Mr. Meyer? I have nothing to add on that. Does anybody have any questions? Mr. President, I move the board approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. Move and seconded the board approve the consent agenda as presented. All in favor, aye. 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 Those nay. Motion carries 6 0. Are there any patron comments this evening? All right. Now we'll move on to the business agenda. First up, financial audit by Mark Bauer. Okay. Well, it's good to be here. I'll try not to bore the craft. <laughs> you know, let's just kind of yeah, just kind of start okay. <clears throat> start one one way, one the other, and then uh, I'll kind of follow your corner, Chad. If that's okay. Absolutely. Uh, and then yeah, one for you. <laughs> okay. Well, it's good to be here. Uh, always enjoy kind of getting together and seeing some familiar faces. So, uh, as we go through it, if you have questions, don't hesitate. You know, just stop me and we'll talk about it as we go through. Uh, obviously, there's 67, 60 some pages or whatever. I'm not going to go through each page in detail, but we'll kind of hit the highlights. And everything went well on the audit. Got along well. Elisa, <coughs> Marla, and Josh uh, do a great job with the book. So. Uh, we were out here for a couple of days in October and do quite a bit of work as much as we can back in the office so we don't interrupt <laughs> the daily flow of, of stuff. But uh, they do a good job. Uh, page one and two is our opinion on the financial statement. And for those of you, you know, that have been on the board, this is going to look very familiar. The format's very familiar to prior year on the last few years on the reports anyway. Uh, this is our opinion on the financial statements. Uh, the rest of uh, the financial statement and notes are yours. We express an opinion as to whether or not, in our opinion, it's fairly presented. Uh, a couple things to point out. If you look on the bottom of page one, it talks about a basis for adverse opinion on general acceptable accounting principles. Remember, when you do your organizational meeting in July, you always adopt a resolution that allows you to waive the use of generally accepted accounting principles and instead use what's called the regulatory basis of accounting. That allows you to put your financial statements and use the same basis of accounting as you do for the budget. Because the Department of Ed and the state requires that you use regulatory basis for budget. So by adopting that waiver, it allows you to present your financial statement on the same basis. So there's nothing wrong with it. We just have to note that. So again, if a reader happens to pick it up, they would understand that the basis of accounting deriving these numbers is regulatory basis. Important part is on the top of the page two, the second paragraph, where it talks about unmodified opinion on regulatory basis of accounting. That's the clean and unqualified opinion. It says, in our opinion, the financial statement and notes are fairly presented in all material respects in accordance with the regulatory basis of accounting. So, that's good. That's good. Any questions on that? The other part of it, dealing with other matters, supplementary information, <coughs> as you see when we go through it, there'll be dividers, the report is broken into the financial statement, the notes, the other matters, regular or supplemental information. This just covers those other schedules and, again, basically just says, again, that we've audited that and, in our opinion, those are fairly presented too, in accordance with the regulatory basis of account. Questions? Okay, the next page, 3-4, is the financial statement. It shows the overview of the district. All the funds of the district, the beginning balance, receipts, expenditures, any balance. A uh, couple things to note on this one. If you look at that ending unencumbered cash balance column, uh, again, we're talking regulatory basis. So we're looking at this statement for compliance with the cash basis law. Cash basis law says that you cannot spend or commit to spend any more funds than you have available. 
at any time. If you look down that column, a negative would indicate a possible stat or cash basis violation. Uh, you'll notice two funds that do show a negative. Those, because of the nature of the funds, those received reimbursement after the end of the year, so it was just the timing. Um, one of them was the, the small rule, the REAP, the small school rule grant deal. That is a federal fund or a federal program. You have to spend the money before you actually request reimbursement, so it's a reimbursement type fund. In this case, you spent the money, request reimbursement, and the reimbursement came after the end of the fiscal year. So, again, it met an exception to the cash base against just a timing deal. Same way with the gifts and grants. Uh, again, there was money that came in after the end of the year that had been spent, so it was just the timing difference. It wasn't that the fund was out of money. Okay? So those are exceptions. So, again, that's good. All funds complied with the cash basis law. Any of unencumbered cash, if you look, again, another thing that we always kind of look at with preparing is, you know, to see that if you're replenishing those cash balances from one year to the next going into the new year. And we'll look at some detail uh, later on of individual funds, but if you look in total, you start the year with 763.4, end of the year with 784.4. So increased a little over 2.5%, 2.7%. So, and again, replenishing those cash balances going into the new, the 18-19 fiscal year. That's always good. Okay? And Josh, if you have comments as we go along, don't hesitate to sure. jump right in. Okay, the next five or six pages are the notes to the financial statements. Uh, again, you kind of think of those as they provide additional explanation and analysis of some of the items in the financial statement. Like note C, for instance, talks about that basis of accounting. Uh, talks a little bit about the difference between regulatory basis of accounting and general accepted accounting principles. Uh, I think the important thing to remember there is the regulatory basis of accounting is a more conservative financial presentation basis because it recognizes expenditures earlier in the cycle than what general accepted accounting principles would be, especially in accounting principles. We'll talk about that here a little bit. So again, just it is more conservative, and if you think about it, that's why the state requires that you use that for budget purposes, because again, they want the most conservative basis of accounting to determine when have you spent that money. They want you to recognize that expenditure as early in the cycle as possible so that you don't overspend. <coughs> uh, if we look over on page seven, note three, talks about uh, compliance with Kansas statutes. As part of an audit in accordance with Kansas Municipal Accounting and Audit Guide, we're required to test compliance with, of the district with the uh, statutes that pertain to financial operations. If we note an instance where the district did not comply, we would require that the district you know, disclose that in its financial statements. Again, you got to think of these as they're your financial statements, not ours. Okay. So when you read that, it says management is aware of no statutory violations. Okay, again, because they're your financial statements. Uh, we're not either, otherwise we'd require that you disclose it. That paragraph down below, it explains what we just talked about. The gifts of grants and the small rural school grant fund uh, meeting the exception to the cash basis law. So, again, no, we didn't note any other steps, any, any other thing that was not compliant. We didn't note anything was not in compliance. So again, that's good. Questions? Deposits, that just talks about, that's one of the, one of the items that we test as far as uh, compliance with statutes. Statutes require that since you're dealing with public funds that you be either covered by FDI insurance or covered by pledged securities at all times during the year. This note talks about at June 30th, okay? Because again, that's the date of the financial statement. We test that throughout the year because your peak periods of deposit generally occur in January, first part of February when you get you know, your tax distribution and then you get your state aid on top of that in February. We tested it throughout the year to make sure that, again, that throughout the year your pledging was adequate to cover your deposits, and it was. So again, that's good. Just wanted to make that point because the note just talks about it as of June 30th. Okay? Uh, next page, 9 and 10, 
just shows an overview of the debt of the district in your all's case. The only debt you have are your lease purchases agreements. And there's two of them that are that are outstanding as of the end of the year. And they're listed there at the bottom. It shows the maturity. We're required to present, or you're required to present, uh, payments, principal and interest for a five-year period, and then in five-year increments until the total obligation is paid off. So again, that's what you see there. So again, I think both of them mature in the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2024 is when the two that are outstanding currently would mature. Okay? Any questions? You all are too easy. <laughs> Making it easy. That was pretty clean so far. So far, so far. And it'll stay that way. Uh, note 12, we talk about defined benefit. Pension plan, I'm not going to go in detail about that other than the point about that. Kind of explains the CAPERS retirement system, the Kansas Public Florida retirement system. Uh, one thing I do want to point out, towards the bottom of page 12, that net pension liability, because that can be confusing. Uh, you're required to uh, report in your financial statements, disclose the amount of what the district share of the net pension liability would be for the CAPER system. Okay, that's what that number represents. Now, don't get concerned, because under current under state law, according to the Constitution, the, the state re is required to make the payment on behalf of the employer for school uh, for school districts. So it's not your obligation, that's in essence the state's obligation, for, but it is your share based on the employees. Uh, and again, that's computed based on actuarial values of the members that are participating and the age and all that, and quite honestly, uh, I don't know exactly other than the number, you know, that we get from their report that goes in here. but. Again, that's kind of the way that works. It reports the amount that, again, is your share of that responsibility, but again, it's not an obligation of the district, okay? Uh, the, way, the way the state handles that for disclosure purposes, and again, it's good that, that you disclose it. It's good that that money is shown up, it shows up in your financial statements because it does flow through. Uh, the way it works is when the state computes the amount that's due for the employer's side. For the employee side, that amount's withheld from the check just like any other CAPERS employer. And then it's remitted, and the girls do that you know, each time they have payroll. For the employer's side, what happens is the state computes that, and then they provide state aid. The state sends a deposit to the district, and then CAPERS takes that money the same day within minutes. So. It flows through, but it's an in and an out. Okay. You have a fund called the Capers Retirement Fund that reflects that. But again, it's just money that comes in, money that comes out. It doesn't, in essence, help your budget. It's not money that you know you can do something else with. But that that's how it gets into your financial statements. And if you look back on that that um, first financial statement, you'll see the Capers Retirement Fund uh, about halfway down the deal. And you can see that roughly 265000 came in and 265000 went out. But that's how that works. It's just a flow through. Similar to the way the special education state aid works, it goes to the co-op. Money comes in, you know, and this, with the special ed money, you transfer it over to the special ed fund and then it's paid to the co-op. So, again, it's just a way to reflect that information in your financial statement. Any questions on that? Okay. Uh, so flip on over to page 14 and 15. Uh, you notice as we, like Chad's got here on, after the page 13, you'll see there's a sub, kind of a heading there, regulatory required supplementary information. Remember that opinion that we talked about at the beginning where it said other matters, supplementary information. From here on back, that's what those paragraphs we're talking to again. We've audited them in our opinion to fairly present in all material respects. Okay, page 14 and 15 is, is an overview that shows the expenditures. In it, all the funds are required to be budgeted, and then the amount that you budgeted, the amount that you spent, and whether or not you spent more than what you budgeted. Remember when you adopt your budget, you set the mill levies necessary in August when you do it. You set the mill levies necessary to fund the next year's budget, but you also 
when you publish that notice of hearing, you're also establishing the maximum amount you can spend in any of those funds. State doesn't care line item wise, but they do care that you don't spend more. Statutes require that you don't spend more than what you budgeted. Okay? So that too is a reason when you look at those budgets, we always call it a legal maximum budget because the amount that you budget is usually considerably higher than what you spent in the prior year. That's to give you budget authority so that you don't end up at the end of the year, you know, cutting it too close and having to, you know, scramble at the end of the year and amend your budget. Okay. So when you look at those columns, you know, if you kind of think about that notice of hearing, you know, it'll reflect the prior year, show the prior year amount, the current year amount, and then the amount budgeted. Usually that third column is considerably higher because, again, it's a legal maximum budget. You're saying, you know, if we spent everything we had available, this is what it would be. But it's not an operating budget. Okay, again, if you look down that variance column, here a negative, zeros are negative, would indicate that you were either at budget or under budget. So, again, if you kind of glance down that column, you'll see all of them are zero or negative, which means all of them comply with the budget model. Remember, under school finance, the general and supplemental general fund. General fund is based on your enrollment and weighted. Uh, if you don't spend it or transfer that money to another fund to help fund future budgets or help fund current budgets, then the money gets returned to the state. So it's kind of imperative that you spend or transfer all of that money. Supplemental general fund, if you get state aid, which you do, and you don't spend all of your money, then you lose the proportionate share of state aid. So again, with getting state aid, it's important that you either spend or, or transfer. Again, when we talk about expenditures for budgetary purposes, we're talking about either purchasing goods and services or transferring to your other special revenue funds. And you know, you do that's the end of the year you do a lot of that at the end of the year when Josh works up the budget. Any questions on that? <coughs> Are we good? Okay. Uh, we're going to speed up. The next 15, 20 pages, 30 pages are just each. Kind of go right through each of the funds. Uh, shows, you know, by line item, the prior year, the current year, compared to budget, variance. Uh, bottom line is going to come down to what was shown on that first financial statement. Okay. Uh, remember, if you look through those, uh, variances are going to vary. Some are going to be way under, some are going to be way under, some are going to be way over, some are going to be close as far as line items. The important part is that bottom line, total expenditures, that you don't go over. And again, that schedule that we just looked at reflects the totals on, from each of these pages. Okay? Okay, let's flip on back to pay. Anybody have any questions? <coughs> okay, good. If we flip on back to page 44, Actually, 42, 43, 41, 42, 43. These represent the district activity funds. Okay? Uh, and again, the only reason I point that out is that we do also audit those as part of our audit. And that those are covered in our opinion regarding that other matters, regulatory required supplementary information. Uh, so 41, 42, and 43. Actually, there's two statements, 41 and 42 and 43 are the district activity funds, 41 of the student organization accounts. But we do audit those, test those, and again, in our opinion, those are fairly presented to you. Okay? Okay, now let's look at the graphs. Let's start on page 44. Uh, this is the fifth year that we've been doing the audit, so now we we show a, usually a five-year trend or reflect a five-year trend at least, so now we've got a full five years to look at. Um, this just shows the ending unencumbered cash of not all of the funds, but the major funds of the district. Uh, you'll notice, and again, we look at this to, to look at to make sure that you're replenishing those cash balances or able to replenish those cash balances and not, you know, probably wouldn't want to see a gradual steady decline that would indicate that you're not being able to transfer money back in at the end of the year to replenish them. And again, for the most part, you can see that those have all stayed up. Capital outlay actually increased about $45,000, $44,000 from the year before. Part of that was attributable to the increase in valuation. 
again, either set on how many mills you can levy in that fund, so the higher the valuation, the more dollars it raises. Uh, the other fund that, uh, when we look at like the contingency reserve, you'll notice that you know the year before you rate, you transferred money in to increase that balance uh, and able to to hold that balance at the same. That represents about four. 4.78% of your general fund budget. Okay. So again, you basically carry the same amount over in contingency reserve. Well, you did carry the same amount as you did the year before. So again, that's good. That's good. Okay? The bond and interest fund, if you remember a couple years ago, after you paid off the bond, you closed that fund, transferred the balance to capital outlay. That's why it dropped to zero. Okay? Okay, any questions on those? Uh, page 45 just shows those ending cash balances compared to what you spent in each of those funds presented and then what you budgeted to spend. The only purpose of that is to kind of show you how far those cash balances go. Again, a lot of times we look at the cash balance numbers and you think, oh wow, but then if you compare that to your budget, it brings it back into perspective. So you can see again, you're carrying over reasonable amounts. Okay. Page 46, 47, and 48 deal with the funding of the general and supplemental general fund. Basically four components to that, the state funding, the local funding, local tax dollars, and then the county sources, motor vehicle tax, recreational vehicle tax. You'll notice on page 48 there's a, a little sliver called operating transfers. That is represented by the, the money that you took out of contingency and transferred back to supplemental general fund. Uh, the reason you did that was, the reason Josh did that was to keep your supplemental general fund budget. Mill levy, about the same, but, but utilize the maximum local option budget for state aid purposes. So again, a good strategy. Uh, you replenish that money with your general fund to put your contingency back to where you started. Mm -hmm. Again, you're able to keep your mill levy about the same and maximize state aid. So, that's a pretty good deal. Pretty good deal. Does anybody have any questions on that? I know Josh and I talked a little bit about that. Uh, a number of our districts have did that this like, past year. Use that to again to keep their mill levy being cognizant of that mill levy. Okay. Uh, page 49. State aid, if you look at those, those haven't changed much over the years. You'll notice that the one that did go up is that CAPERS. Remember we talked about the CAPERS Special Retirement Fund that flowed through? You'll notice it increased from 178000 to 265000 Again, that's not your money. That's just an in and an out. But the reason it increased is in prior year, in 1617, the state was only able to fund three quarters, three of the four quarterly payments. Uh, because of cash flow problems. In 1718, they did fund all four quarters. Uh, so that's why that increased. Otherwise, it would have been, you know, should have been roughly that 265 year old. Okay? But again, remember, that's just an in and an out on your books. Okay? Uh, on the next page, 50. That, again, these are just general, this is just general and supplemental general fund. So again, when you look at the functional expenditures, you see instructions increased a little bit. That's good. Uh, state always likes to see more dollars going into instruction. Uh, your transfers dropped a little bit, but not really. You're able to remember, we looked at those cash balances. You were replenishing your cash balances, so you were transferring about the same. The reason it dropped is how that capers flow through. It, they changed the way that worked. In 1617, that was required to be flowed through the general fund and then transferred to the CAPER Special Retirement Fund. In 1718, they decided that seemed a little silly, so they just allowed you to put it directly into the CAPERS fund. So in 1617, that was reflected in your general fund as a transfer. 1718 is not. Again, that's just a change in how the state handled it. So again, if you took that out, your transfers, or added that back, your transfers would be you know, relatively same, probably up a little bit. Okay? I know that's confusing, but that's the way they, again, if hopefully they're, 
like we were talking before the meeting started, hopefully there'll be some continuity and some consistency in the school finance formula so that, again, you know, it'll be easier to compare from year to year. Hasn't been that way the last five or six years. Okay, uh, instructional those functional expenditures, if you put that in a pie chart, you can see that, again, from year to year, that doesn't change much. Then you need to caution you here, remember this is just general and supplemental general. So when you look at that instruction, you know, that may seem low as a percent of your expenditures, but remember this is just general and supplemental. You transfer money to funds that are predominantly instruction, like at risk, uh, special education. You know, you're taking money that are in the transfer part of this pie, putting it in other funds that are predominantly instruction. As a rule of thumb, you can almost add those two, and that'll give you close to your total instructional expenditures as far as a percent. Uh, I computed it, and to give you an idea for, again, not counting capital outlay, but for 16, 17, that was 69%. For 17, 18, that was 68%. So, pretty consistent. There's no magic number. The state has kind of used, floated around 65% as kind of a, the, the bar to shoot for, and you can see your your over there. So again, that's good. Questions on that? But again, you have to remember, this is just, just two pies presented are just general and supplemental. Uh, once you throw everything in together, all your other funds, you're at that 68, 69%. Okay? Uh, 53 just shows we talked about the components of your general and supplemental general fund budgets. Remember, to spend those budgets, you either purchase goods or services, that's that middle bar, the top bar is the total budget, or you transfer the money to other funds that are used then for those the purposes for whatever the fund is, at risk, special education, and that. So again, you can kind of see those three components, and again, like we talked about, the transfers drop, but it's that because of how the CAPERS money was handled. Okay. What's interesting about this is look at your top, top total funding. You can see over a five-year period, and that's where we get back to the school finance deal. You know, three of those years were block grant years where you got the same amount that you got the year before, basically, other than what you did in supplemental. So, you know, with the new formula, if it stays with the increase in base state aid per pupil, and if your enrollment holds or up, goes up a little bit, you would see some increase. Again, we're back to enrollment being the, the, the driving part of the vehicle, I mean, what drives the, the whole system. Because again, we'll be using weighted enrollment, and again, that's going to become critical again. For uh, page 54 shows the expenditures, by, again, compared to the last five years. Uh, you know, again, not much change there from year to year with the funds. Uh, capital outlet, we talked about it, the expenditures dropped a little bit, cash balance increased a little bit. There's that CAPERS, uh, special retirement, you can see the spike in it this last year. That was, again, attributable to the state fully funding it in terms of 17, 18. Okay? Federal aid, uh, again, you kind of see the difference there. The big reason for the drop was your uh, 21st century, uh, the year before you got like $60,000, and I think that was what, three year, three year, five year, five year deal, so you, have, you ran the full five yeah. years, yeah, so that's the reason that dropped, uh, was when that fell off. There's your valuation uh, from, again, we talked about how valuation drives the dollars for capital outlay, it drives the mill levy, the mill rates, for supplemental, uh, so again, as that increases, raises a few more dollars for capital outlay, helps you hold your mill rate consistent for supplemental. <clears throat> so again, that's always good when you see that increase in valuation. A few years ago, you know, it had that big drop, and that, those were some tough years in terms of mill rates. And you got some extraordinary <laughs> in-state aid that they of the state allowed to help offset some of that. I think your 18-19 held about the same mm -hmm. by, as far as 17-18, so you know, that kind of leveled off. Yeah. So. 
Okay, the last page, last couple pages, there's your mill rate. Again, you can see over the five year period, you've done a good job holding that. Uh, and again, I, I, that's something I think, you know, reflects favorably from the community in terms of appreciating that the mill rates haven't, you know, jumped all over the place. So, and again, that just doesn't happen without some planning and some work. And uh, Josh does a good job in, in working the budget to make sure that that has stayed relatively the same. There's your FTE. Now again, you know, like we talked about, that's going to become critical in future years as far as dollars. That's all I have as far as the audit report. Does anybody have any questions before I go over a couple letters of communication and then I'll let you get on with your meeting? Uh, I know that's a lot to digest in 10, 15 minutes or whatever. Probably took a little longer than that. You know, don't hesitate. If you have questions, Josh, you can visit with Josh. You can, look, you can call me. Again, I'll be happy to visit over the phone. If something, if I said something that then you read something tonight when you can't sleep and you're trying to read this stuff, and uh, if something doesn't make sense or if you think I don't remember him talking about that, you can always call me. But just be prepared that I like to talk. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it might be more than a five-minute phone call. I expect a lot of phone calls from the, yeah, from yeah, the class. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, notes. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> They're like, holy cow. Oh, you ought to get extra credit for this. Talk to your teacher about you know, <laughs> to bear through an audit report. These are the same communications that were, we did last year. They're required communications. <clears throat> the single page letter is just, uh, when we perform an audit, we're required to evaluate internal control to determine the procedures that we will apply. There should be a single page and then a statement page. Uh, we're required to evaluate internal control so that we can determine the auditing substantive procedures that we will perform. Because again, we plan this to, our goal is to issue an unqualified opinion like we did. So we have to review the internal control of the district to determine, okay, how much can we rely on it and what can we rely on and not and what do we have to test. That's, again, kind of the nutshell of the process. When we do that, we're required to report that evaluation to, to, to management, which would be you and Josh and, and that. So that's what this deals with. It's the same comment that we've had uh, over the years. Occasionally, we've had some other comments. But this year, it's just the segregation of duties due to the small number of people in the accounting function. You know, they do a good job, and it's nothing they're doing wrong, but with only two people. You know, we have to consider that when we perform our tests, knowing that, you know, it, things can't be segregated like what would be ideal. That's all that means. Uh, again, our comment kind of reflects that because basically, you know, we don't have any recommendation other than to keep doing what you're doing. You know, the board reviews and approves the bills. Uh, Josh reviews and approves purchase orders. We test that. We test those things to make sure that that part of the control is working. Uh, your checks require three signatures. Again, that's a mitigating uh, factor in terms of the, you know, the process. So again, basically just keep doing what you're doing. Just keep doing what you're doing. They do a good job. Josh does, does a good job reviewing the bills, and we didn't uh, the items we tested didn't run into any any issues there at all. Okay. Uh, the last one is called a letter to those charged with governance. <laughs> which is you all. Okay. The idea behind this is that, uh, you know, again, if you think of these auditing standards as encompassing all audits, you know, a lot of times the board <laughs> doesn't necessarily have probably quite the grasp of the day-to-day -day activities as you all do in terms of what's happening, you know. So, again, that's the idea behind this. We're just required to report uh, if we encountered any difficulties doing the audit, if we had any differences of opinion with management, which would be superintendent, clerk, uh, regarding the recording of transactions. We didn't, never have. Uh, we'll talk various times throughout the year to talk some there about that. Uh, they'll call with questions, we'll talk about it, and come up with a mutually agreeable way of handling it from an accounting standpoint. So, again, 
all healthy, I think, a healthy relationship in terms of all of that. So basically, that's all good. That's all good. Just a little wordy. <laughs> but again, that's kind of standard wordy. Okay, I'll, I'll quit there. Does anybody have anything? Any questions? And again, if you you know have questions later on, don't hesitate to to uh, give me a call or come in and visit with Josh. And then you can call me from his office. Or I'll be happy to explain to you the further. Again, we appreciate being of service. Look forward to working with you in the future. One thing you had mentioned uh, in our discussion was uh, investing our idle funds. We had yes. done that. Okay. To to that uh, sure. Uh, you know, we look at those cash balances, and again, if you flip over to that page three and four real quick, uh, you know, when you look at those funds, uh, the way you all have yours set up is it's basically invested in a, in a now account, which is an interest bearing account, so you do earn interest on it. Uh, but there is a certain level, you know, the money that you have invested in contingency or the money that you have in the contingency fund, a portion of the capital outlay fund, or funds that you don't necessarily use on a monthly basis. But I was telling Josh, what we're kind of talking with our districts about, all of our districts, not just you all, but uh, in the past with the way interest rates have been, quite honestly, there wasn't enough difference between what a now account would pay or what a money market would pay or CDs that it was really worth, you know, taking money out and investing in, in three months CDs and then pulling them back. But with the way interest rates, and Chad can probably talk better about this than me, but the way interest rates have done the last you know, six months, they've started to come back a little bit. So I think it's worth taking a look at and maybe you know, determining, OK, what are really of this money do we have that's idle? And again, that's going to vary from, from what type of time of year it is. When you get your tax money, you're going to have more idle funds than before. But if you can establish you know, kind of that this is the amount that we're not going to fall below mm -hmm. and take that money and invest it or ladder it in CDs, you might be able to, again, get a little bit higher, a little bit more interest that would be used for your operations. So that was the, the talk that, that Josh and I had that, again, it's worth looking at. I'm not saying that you've you got can't. an action item on the agenda for that. So okay. I just wanted to make sure okay. they heard. Absolutely. I, it's more than just my recommendation. No, and, and actually, you know, when I brought it up, Josh had made the comment that you know, he'd already talked about that with you all and was going to be talking about that with you all. So I think it's a good idea. I think it's a good idea to take some of that and begin. What you might want to consider doing is taking, taking however much you feel comfortable in terms of what is our idle amount, the amount that we don't fall below, and then, you know, laddering some CDs, starting with the three month, six month, the year laddering them and then rolling them and then you know if each quarter you may have a CD come and do if you don't need it then you just ring it so again it'll, it'll learn you you know again CD rates are better than what they were they are substantial yeah yeah so <clears throat> a year two three years ago CDs were lower than, than some of the money market accounts and now accounts so it just didn't make sense to tie money up and if you weren't going to get you know, a significant better return. So. It's a good plan. It's a good plan. Is there anything else? That... Um, I know it's not your responsibility, but it is your, your firm, and it's sort of our responsibility with the rec commission oh, audit. Aaron's working on that. Aaron, uh, the guy that comes out and helps me with this audit, is working on that. He's kind of running that one. Mm -hmm. uh, he's been working on it. Uh, they've been information getting back. You know, he's been getting with the director, uh, and he just hadn't had a chance to get back to it and finish it up. But right. he's it's still in process. It's still in process. Okay. Uh, the way that will work, as far as procedurally, you know, once he's to the point where he would be ready to present it to the board, he'd do similar to what I'm doing tonight. He'd present it to the board, and then it would be to the rec board. To the rec board, then it would become public information. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I know he's working on it, and. And, and again, going forward on that, we talked about, you know, because they, from year to year, then the law has changed in terms of what, when an audit's required and when it isn't, and if it's not, the option of doing agreed upon procedures. So I think it would be good to get in some sort of a cycle 
Uh, yeah. And, you know, even if an audit's not required, maybe, you know, looking at the agreed upon procedures. Again, the continuity in, in doing something every year is probably worth something as far as, because it's hard to come in and do an audit every three years or four years. So, but he is working on it, and, and again, I'm hoping that, and he is too, that he'll be finishing that up shortly. All right. Anything else, Mark? Thank you. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Again, appreciate being of service, and if we can ever do anything, don't, don't hesitate to call. Do we have some extra ones? Should I believe we have some. We've got yeah, these are. Do you got hit enough? Yep, for, yeah. Enough okay. for yep. Great. And I will take these back. This mm -hmm. one is probably for. Work. Okay, thanks again. All right. Thanks again. Okay. Any, uh, any discussion there? I'll entertain a motion to approve the audit report. Mr. President, I move that the board approve the 2017-18 audit report as presented. Second. So move and second and the board approve the 2017-18 audit report as presented. All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Motion carried, 6-0. <coughs> All right, uh, item two, senior release applications. Um, since this is uh, outside of what's normal for uh, board policy on uh, you know, what we have for all of our students, uh, students can apply to be dismissed from school for part of the day during the second semester. So we have a few of those. Mr. White, come on. I had uh, four students um, that were interested in that. Jace Britton, Riley Burbank, Alexa Redarmal, and George Wildinger were all students that were interested. I received a letter uh, from each one of those that requested that and explained to me why they wanted it. And I have a letter or have, have on the phone talked to each of those employers that will be in, that those kids will be working for, with the exception of Riley's, and her manager was out um, on vacation for a while. Uh, so I would send the recommendation to the board that we, we allow that can, with Riley's being contingent upon her employer agreeing that they're gonna, she's gonna be working those hours. That's, okay. Any questions on that? I think it's a good program. I think it's, it's a good way to help our students. So we've done it for years. Are they all seniors? Mm -hmm. They're growing up on you, Debbie. Yeah, well, there's one of the names that, uh, yeah, I think she's that one. Okay. Okay. Any thoughts? All right. Entertain the motion. Mr. President, I move the board approve the list of students uh, for second semester early release as presented. Second. With the uh, what was that? Well, with the contingent that Riley. Okay, with Riley's yeah. contingency. Okay. Is there a second? Second. All right. Uh, it's been moved and seconded that the board approve the list of students for second semester early release as presented with Riley's contingency. All in favor, aye. 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 nay. Motion carried. 6 0. Thank you. Uh, item three, superintendent contract information. This is just a review of the contract. If there needs to be any changes, uh, I'd ask for approval on that next uh, board meeting. But this is a two-year contract, so what, would, uh, what the board would be approving is just rolling over that two-year contract for, the, for next year and the following year. Um, salary would determine uh, after teacher negotiations are complete, because we tie the raise to that. Um, one change will be on number 10. Um, it's part of the teacher's contract, but for some reason wasn't part of mine on sick and bereavement leave. The last sentence there, uh, we pay employees out their sick leave, unused sick leave at $20 a day, uh, up to the maximum that's allowed to be accumulated. <coughs> I'd ask for that to be added to my contract like it is for the teachers, but other than that, everything's the same. <coughs> Are you going to sign it, bud? <laughs> <laughs>
I think that's reasonable. <laughs> Out of ten. So. We'll have it on the agenda for next month. Have any thoughts about any of that? Between now and then, let me know. All right. Any other discussion on that item? We'll move on to item four, student information system action item. Uh, th this has been a significant process. Um, I included a lot of information here for you. Uh, we've had a committee of uh, three teachers, Mrs. Hacker, uh, Stephanie Smith, and Mr. White, and myself, and uh, Mr. Watts. Uh, so we had kind of all the bases covered, but that page 24 there shows you the request for proposals that we sent out. Um, it's not really bid process because this is the service that's provided, um, similar to hiring an attorney that provides a service. It's, it's not prudent to just take the lowest bid um, for something like that. This is similar. So um, we get proposals. If they meet our standards, um, we choose which one is best. Price has an effect on all that. But, um, so you can see from this that there's a lot that the system does. Um, probably only 20% of what it does is the gradebook and attendance, which is what most of our employees use it for, for their uh, grading the students. And, uh, but a lot of behind the scenes stuff. Um, so that's the reason I included that for you there. So <clears throat> we have three systems, PowerSchool, Infinite Campus, and Skyward. All three of them um, fairly similar. Um, uh, Infinite Campus is one, Infinite Campus and Skyward really do all of those functions themselves. Um, I, I take that back. Infinite Campus does all of those th themselves, no third party fees. Skyward, uh, the messaging system is a separate vendor. They just lump the payments into that uh, quote. Um, uh, uh, they also charge extra for web hosting which is kind of, it was very common now, rather than having all of the information on our server here in the building, um, you know, it's hosted on their site and we access it uh, electronically. Um, so they charge a little bit extra. PowerSchool does everything except the messaging system is a separate vendor that uh, the systems talk to each other, we just have to work through another vendor. So it's pretty complicated on the pricing. Um, but bottom line, first year cost, uh, uh, this column here, that's bold, you see the differences in those costs. Um, today I got a call back from the Skyward vendor, they dropped their price, initial price, by a little over $8,000. Um, so actually it would be $43,852 for the initial cost, so a little, a little closer to the others. Um, and then the annual cost, um, you can see those comparisons uh, here. So I included the third party fees because like right now we have a messaging system with our with our current system. Um, we need that messaging system so if we have to go out and get it from a third party I want that to be a comparison. So what's actually on the quote is listed here in this column. Uh, and that annual cost down the road, there will be cost increases, percentage increases, um, and it will change with enrollment. We have more, more kids, more employees, that price will go up. If we have fewer, it'll go down. Um, so that's just a good rough estimate for annual costs. Um, uh, currently, we're paying 13400 So you can see two of those systems, we would be paying less. Than our, current, than our current amount. So there's the cost comparison. Uh, if we forget about the cost comparison, uh, the committee uh, unanimously chose power school. Forget about the cost. That's the, for ease of operation, uh, majority of school districts in the state use that. Um, Infinite Campus was probably a close second, and then Skyward was, was last on our list. Skyward, what special <clears throat> co-op put in? They do. Okay. Um, Skyward. One benefit with that system is they have a, you know, the budgeting and human resources side also. So theoretically, you could have the student information system with all the 
stuff we're talking about here, plus our budget software and uh, payroll and personnel and all that. That would be nice to have, um, but we're, we're in good shape on that side of things as it is. Good enough shape. You know, terribly happy with it, but it's good enough. But, so it's not worth, um, we didn't think it was worth uh, having one system district-wide would, would be a benefit also to justify the cost. But. So on these other pages I break down what is the, uh, what are we looking at for the annual, annual cost, uh, really license and support. Um, we're looking to do an online registration and enrollment. That's a significant cost with this. Uh, that would mean uh, you don't get a paper packet of uh, 35 pages to fill out and bring them in and come write your check. You get on online and verify that your information is still correct and here's your permission forms. You click that, yep, I read them and I agree. And, um, you can pay online if you want or mail a check. Uh, that'll save significant resources right there. That'll save $600 in in postage alone each year. Um, plus we have labor costs and data entry. Um, and then the initial cost, what is tied up with that? Just data conversion, um, taking our current data and moving it over to a new system, setting up that system, and then uh, training cost is significant with, with all three of those. Um, so I wasn't going to go through all of those. I did provide the individual quotes for you here, um, but I wasn't going to go through those in detail unless you needed me to. Um, issues with our current system are our student parent portal, where you can log on to see your kids' grades or attendance, any of that. Uh, it, our current system is okay, but it's pretty mediocre. You see what you need to see. Um, it's a little dated. Um, our system for our teachers and, and everybody is not very user friendly. Our messaging system is terrible. Uh, the other day we had a late start and it took me 10 minutes to get through all the screens to get a, me a simple message sent out. Uh, also, we don't have m we have very little control of our data. You know, it's hosted somewhere else. If we want to pull up uh, a grade card from last year's fifth grade class, I can't do it. I have to call them to do it which is a little bit insane that we can't make those changes to pull up an attendance record from three years ago. It's not possible. Uh, so all these other systems, we have a lot more control. Uh, three quarters of our teachers said they're not satisfied with it. So we have most of their support. There's a few that like it. Um, several that say, yeah, it's good enough. Right. And those are the ones that really, I think, are hesitant to change. Yeah. With anything, but yeah. but I can tell you from the uh, administrative side, GoEduStar is not not good. Um, that student data is ours, not GoEduStar's, and I shouldn't have to contact them to request a report and get the report and turn out being the wrong one. So I have to request another one, and that's where we're at right now with it. Uh, Mr. White's familiar with Power School. Mrs. Hacker's familiar with Power School. So we do have a, a few on site that, that can help us through that process. But. A few, few teachers have come in from Power School. Okay. Power schools also, I think. So, so it's not going to be perfect. It'll be a challenge to change over. There'll be some hiccups for sure. Um, so can you talk to other schools who use that system? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we have it. Yep. Poisington just went to online enrollment here recently. Take online payments. The food service program works works well for them. Within our committee, we had people talk to schools with every one of those three. Yeah. Kind of tried to get the pros and cons. Yeah, we had a list of school districts we knew used each system, and everybody on the committee kind of reached out to somebody that they knew in one of those districts. And, yeah. That might be one of the differences. Power School has 70 or 80 percent of schools in Kansas have Power School, where Skyward has 34 schools in Kansas. You know, and so when we do need to reach out to somebody, Power School will be an easier, be easier to find somebody who maybe has gone through it and we can research. Let's do the information <coughs> that um, 
we have two buildings, so the district has two buildings. Mm -hmm. Junior, senior, high school, and elementary. What about that? Preschool and... Uh, not physical buildings. Okay. Um, you know, St. John Junior Senior High School and St. John Elementary. Okay. So, student attendance center, okay. I guess. So when we set things up in the system, it'll be it'll be separated in that way. Okay. So my recommendation and recommendation of the committee would be the power school with the first year cost of twenty four thousand two seventy two. I'm using that number on the quote, uh, the, this down here. Um, and then uh, and I would add the estimated annual cost on that motion, uh, estimated annual cost of 8,935. So moved. Second. It's moved and seconded the board approve a proposal from Power School with a first year cost of $24,272 and an estimated annual cost of $8,935. Is that yeah. correct? Okay. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed, nay. <coughs> Motion carried, 6-0. When are they going to start the installation? Will it be a summer thing? Uh, no, it'll start this spring. Okay have to work out all those details of when that needs to be done. But initially we had talked, if we had a decision made by March, uh, we would have been in good shape to get started in, for a long time, so there's plenty of time. And this new system is actually cheaper on an ongoing mm -hmm. basis. Yeah, so basically compared 13.4 to 9.600. <coughs> Um, I, one thing I didn't share, that $9,560 includes $3,000 a year in uh, or, uh, like a library of training, uh, online videos. Um, I think it's a little steep, but we may not need that after a couple of years where we'd have people on site that can train the new people. So that $9,500 could be closer to $6,500. We'll keep that on for at least two years. But. Great. Well, we appreciate the effort there, Mr. White. Come up with the best system. Mm -hmm. All right, anything else there? <coughs> Item number five, investment <coughs> of idle funds. Uh, this gives you a picture of... Um, uh, our high and low balances for each month, this was from last budget year. So you can see there's periods of time in here where we have significant room to have some money invested. Um, we, get, we get down low uh, in January, <coughs> really November, December, January, we, it gets a little tight. Um, but what we're looking at doing is having $100,000 in the CD for a year, um, just just roll that over every year. Um, I feel confident we can do that. We get a better rate a, a year than we would on the short term. And then come back in uh, February, um, we'll be looking at right here, and uh, get a three or six month CD there for, you know, uh, two, three thousand, hundred thousand dollars above what that hundred. Um, so we'll come back and look at adding that in there, and then that gets us into. Uh, August, and then we can make that determination whether we want to invest some more to get us a few more months, or uh, or just let it mature and and wait till January and February to renew again. So that's our plan. Elise, anything else on that? On that plan? I, I have the letters from the banks if okay. you want to see them. But yeah. So Elise has sent letters to the banks to get uh, our. Uh, you know, we have to let let. Each bank, our board policy is that each bank gets to bid it in, it's in, our, in our communities, um, with, whether they would pay a, an inch, what interest rate they would pay. Uh, theoretically, we just pick the highest one and roll with it. Um, for this board to invest funds, it needs to meet the minimum uh, for the municipal rates. Uh, that's set by the state of Kansas. I think today it was 2.74. Mm -hmm. 
that's what we'd be looking at. We just <coughs> set it at that. Um, the changes weekly. Right. Rate. Yeah, every week. And I don't know, three years ago it was less than a percent, probably. Yeah, it is about to the 25 basis points. So significantly higher. So SJA and Bank has agreed to match the municipal rate and uh, um, American State was two and a quarter. <clears throat> so we're looking at 2.74 for SJA and Bank compared to two and a quarter for American state. Any questions on that? And this is just for $100,000 for 12 months, starting January 1st. And then we come back in to do the same thing in February. And we'll have a recommendation uh, in our January meeting. That sounds good. So my recommendation would be to go with uh, SG and Bank for the one year at the uh, Rate set by the state of Kansas. So you're looking just for a motion of which <coughs> which bank to go with? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. And that rate, and I guess I just set it at two point seven four. Um. Well, it'd be whatever the rate is whenever you on that day decide to do okay. the CD. Since it, it moves. Right. Okay. But you have the parameters that each bank would work with, so really you just need to know which bank to go with. Right. So, to simplify the motion. Sure. Mr. President, I move the board approve the investment of vital funds with SGM Bank. Second. Second. Move the second of the board approve the investment of vital funds with SJA and Bank of Kansas. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, nay. All right, motion carried. Six zero. Thank you, good day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it can move pretty fast. <laughs> Communications, board members' activities and reports. <coughs> Start with Carl tonight. No, I don't have any. Debbie. Special ed co-op last month was a short meeting. All we really talked about was our audit information. And that guy only spent seven minutes going over that. Well, that's not enough time. <laughs> we got just as big a report. <laughs> he only highlighted two pages. <laughs> Our meeting this month is going to be um, uh, just a, a Zoom. Was there anything substantial in the audit? No. no. Everything looked really good in the audit. Um, really good. So. Positive? It was. It was very positive. Um, it's taken them a while to get to that point, but it, it looked... There were no, um, what's the formal term for it, the inaccuracies or whatever, the objections or whatever, there were no deficiencies. There were no deficiencies pointed out. Okay. Good. What else you got? That's pretty much it. It was, <laughs> like I said, it was a short meeting. Okay. All right. Thank you. There. Got nothing. Anything, Sean, tonight? No. Terry? No. Nothing from me. Um, administrative reports. We'll start with Mr. White. Okay, um, something I intended on kind of reporting on last month and didn't get it on my agenda. Uh, we have a student leadership group that's made up of 13 students. Uh, Mr. Andorino is kind of taking charge of that. Um, those 13 students represent the top four grades, 9 through 12. 
Um, they went to Washburn University on November, or excuse me, they went to Prescott Island on November 7th, and Washburn uh, head basketball coach was there to kind of talk to him about leadership qualities and, and what it takes and why being a, a good leader is, is an important um, attribute. Uh, this February 6th, um, we'll host, Skyline will come here, and we have Dustin Galen going to come uh, visit with the kids kind of about the same thing, but also beyond just having the speakers, um, our students are going to kind of work on uh, on different projects in the school. Um, we're going to try and implement an etiquette type program for the grade school kids with our high school kids with those, that leadership group taking that on and stuff. So um, look for some good things to come out of that and we're going to continue to grow that and, and do that year after year. Um, our post-secondary visits are complete where the students go off to different colleges, Votex, things like that. Um, we ended up with freshmen going to Hutchison and Sterling College last week. Um, I kind of uh, surveyed some people, um, teachers that went with them, students, to see if those are things that we want to continue to do. And I think without a doubt those have opened up some conversations about career options that are that are helpful to our kids. So um, we'll look at continuing that as far as that process goes, where every class goes to uh, some type of a different post-secondary institution. We're not about pushing everyone into college, per se, as far as like a four-year school or something, but we want our kids to see the options to, for different training programs. Um, we have one student who, um, Parents came and talked to me about uh, interest in an FFA program, and we don't offer that. It was Carolyn Dunn, Preston, uh, very interested in being involved. Stafford has um, the FFA program over there, and, and they kind of, you know, Carolyn kind of took the bull by the horns and went and talked to that teacher to see if Preston came over just one, uh, one part of the day, if he could get through that FFA program that way, still remain a student here, but uh, talk to Dallas Wolf, the principal over there, the teacher's all on board with it, and we can make it work with his schedule, so I think we'll be, uh, he'll have an opportunity to participate in the FFA program through Stafford's teacher, um, and he'll get credit from us for that, I mean, it'll be, um, but something we can offer a student that we normally wouldn't be able to. Um, one of the things that I know you guys talked about last spring was service learning projects for high school students. And Mr. Mandarino is again trying to get that up. And uh, this spring, he's he's been using time in class now to get kids ready for those projects. We'll be seeing some service learning opportunities that our kids are involved in through the spring. So another good uh, thing going on. Uh, date night is December 17th. We have our uh, junior high, high school band and vocal concerts. Good entertainment, good time, and it's cheap. So <laughs> um, I encourage you all to get out there and see see those uh, our performing arts kids involved too. Big shout out, Joel Delp was recognized. I'm sure you all know as a um, 1A cross country Kansas coach of the year. That's quite an honor. And it's I went and talked to Joel, <coughs> congratulated him right away. And in his humble fashion, he said, well, I've got really good kids and a great assistant. So, <laughs> you know, that's just his mentality on that. Winter sports kicked off. We're all in full swing, I think. Um, basketball tournament, our boys won the KD Classic again. Our girls ended up fourth. We clawed our way back and almost got that third place win, I think, but uh, didn't quite make it. Um, Paige was named all tournament team. Is that right, Paige? Mm -hmm. Congratulations. Was she MVP? No, it was not MVP. Oh, okay. Just and then uh, on the boys' side, they said they said Colin Holling, but I think it was Tanner, wasn't it? Yeah, it was so, Tanner. Okay, they they made an error. Uh, Tanner made uh, all tournament team, and Mason was most valuable player in the tournament. So very good representation. Our kids were all represented the school community very well. Um, last month we talked about co-oping with uh, 
Stafford for junior high wrestling, and you guys agreed to allow some students to do that. So this week I talked to them, and that will start somewhere around February 1st. Um, we have three middle school kids that told me then that they're interested. I would guess two of them will actually follow through, but we may pick up one or two. Um, they will be responsible for getting themselves to and from practices. That won't be something that school will do, but uh, they'll be wrestling for Stafford, but if they make it to uh, state level competition, they'll be putting on the same level. <coughs> St. John will be have wrestling. So. Can I just say for the um, basketball, <coughs> um, we will have a student that Video, mm -hmm. the that's so much better than, than what we had last year. Uh -huh. So, we're doing it, that's a big improvement. Okay, I think Seth did all of the, I'm not sure if he did. And I know I appreciate it when they'd scan over and check the score. Yeah. Yeah, it's great uh, to be able to watch that and, and see it online. And I checked, I think there were probably around 20 people that were watching most all the times. So. I think there were 36 at the the boys. The boys <laughs> Nobody heard it was a good one. <laughs> yeah. Kind of a scrappy um, Down on the administrative side, uh, we've talked about the ACT and work keys. Every one of our juniors will take the ACT February 20th. Um, <coughs> and the work keys is, is it tests the knowledge and skills of, for uh, career and technical education type uh, aptitudes. Um, in the past, we've given all of the seniors the work keys. This year, we're going to have to, we're going to give the seniors and the juniors both the work keys. Um, and we originally were just going to do the seniors, but the state changed what they how they were going to do that. And after this year, they're only going to allow juniors. So we didn't want this year's juniors to miss that opportunity. And it basically, after they take it, it gives them a credential. A certificate that says that you're you're qualified at this level. Um, there are jobs in some counties. Uh, I know um, the up around um, Manhattan, uh, Salina. There are a lot of companies that are going to this certification where the kids have to have or incoming employees, potential employees have to have that certification. So our kids will already have that if they go into those job markets. So be good for them. Um, one of the things that I wanted to do this year was kind of see where we are as a staff, what kind of connections we're making with students. Um, there's a lot of data research that uh, shows that if students feel comfortable with just one or two adults in a building, um, it's a lot safer school uh, because adults are a lot more likely to hear if something's going wrong. But also, it helps with the social and emotional uh, side of education, which is as important as the academic, but totally separate. Um, and so I sent out surveys. I got all but 10 of our students to, to reply. And first, I surveyed the teachers to see how they thought we were doing. And I surveyed the students to see how we were really doing. And um, we say, you know, we have some gaps there, and we were. We were Pretty honest with ourselves with the first survey, but this the other day at our faculty meeting we had some discussions about how we can fill those gaps and make sure we're reaching as many of those students as we possibly can. Um, right now we had about 21, 21 students that said that they didn't really have a connection, you know, and that's as far as do you trust? Is there somebody here you trust to go talk to about things that might be going going on in your life or whatever? So. Those are numbers we'll try to reduce and something we'll continue to do from year to year and emphasize that academics isn't all that we do. You know, it's not all in the classroom. And um, so um, just something that hopefully hopefully we can grow from. And it was it was kind of humbling to see the numbers when you looked at it, when you say, Mr. Moritz, I mean some of the people on the list that um, that we feel like we need to make connections with. We, you know, those are kids that might be might be getting looked over in a lot of ways. They shouldn't. Um, soon we'll be starting scheduling for the 1920 school year. <laughs> uh, we're going to be looking at making a few changes possibly and bringing power school in will make a difference in how we schedule, not this year, but in upcoming years. But um, We're going to have to add one class of um, 
math that's kind of an intermediate math um, to, to bridge a gap there. So I'm not sure how we're going to do that personnel-wise, but that's we're, we're I'm going to work with Ms. Hacker pretty closely and see if we can come up with some ways to make our schedule a little bit more efficient to serve the, the, what the kids need more than uh, more than what we are now. Maybe try and keep some classes from conflicting that are kind of. Uh, and I'll just use an example, college algebra conflicts with band, you know, and those are only offers one hour. So hopefully we can find a way to reduce those conflicts so that we're not taken away from some of our electives for other classes. And uh, this has been the fastest semester I think I've ever had <laughs> of education. <laughs> we are already closing in. I think we have eight school days left. So. Uh, December 20th, last day of the first semester. They challenged me, haven't you guys? <laughs> any questions on, that's a lot, but any questions for me? No. We also um, had a very successful um, Scholars Bowl. We did, we ran off, thank you for adding that, we ran off a very good Scholars Bowl meeting here. Um, we went to one of the neighboring school that I was going, oh my gosh, it's us how they do it around here, <laughs> you know? And I talked to Miss Norton, and she said, no, we've got everything. And when we ran it off, everything went smooth. And, um, I was also, I think I got an email today from Mac about District, about Honor Choir, Ball State Choir. Let me see. Biggest congratulations to Aaron Crispin, Shayla Garcia, Bree Meyer, and Brittany Shrug on their selection to KMEA All State Choirs. Aaron, Bree, and Brittany were selected for Allstate High School Treble Choir. Shayla was selected as an alternate for both High School Trevor, Treble and High School Mixed Choir. So congratulations to those students, our vocal group, doing, doing good things. Okay. And they will, uh, the state convention is February 21st through the 23rd. Um, with all state choir being the 23rd at 11 a.m. Century 2 Convention Hall in, in Wichita, Kansas. Okay. Anything else that you guys can think of I missed? Okay. That's a lot. That is a lot. <laughs> Mr. Meyer. Um, these first two bullets kind of go together. That student information system and our accreditation system. Um, our accreditation system, uh, one of the things that brought out in our needs assessment was uh, connections with families, uh, doing a better job uh, engaging parents and, uh, and families. And this student information system will help us do a better job of that um, uh, with the, the parent portal. So uh, it's, it's not just a, a data system, it is uh, part of our, our goal of, of doing, doing better. Um, the, the accreditation process, um, just to remind you, um, it's important that you, you all are aware of it. It's a five-year process. We're in year two. Um, the top in there was identify needs. That was year one. Uh, year two is now where we're uh, determining goals and developing plans. Uh, so really years two, three, and four kind of fit within those next three. Um, there would be some crossover. So developing specific goals uh, for, for district improvement and building level improvement. Um, and what we cannot have, we had good discussions in our district leadership team meeting, uh, we need to be able to move the needle and, and really improve. Uh, what does that mean? Well, improving state assessment scores is not it. That's not going to help my kid be successful when she gets out in the real world. You know, maybe that's an indicator of we're doing a better job uh, educating our kids on math. But, um, but our goals have to be something that move the needle. Uh, increase ACT scores, that's, that's good, but that's, that's not success. Uh, 4.0 is not success. It's one measure of success. It is important. Um, uh, one measure of success that we look at, and I know I've, we've looked at this data before, but I'm going to bring it up again. This is our post-secondary success measure. So we're looking at post-secondary education. Why is this important? Uh, because we need that effective rate up there in the blue on the top right, 70 to 75%. Why is that important? Based on research, 
about 72% of the jobs in the year 2020 will require some sort of post-secondary education. Uh, does that mean every kid needs to get a bachelor's degree? No, it's not that at all. But there needs to be some sort of training, some sort of education after high school for students to be able to get a job that gets them into the middle class. Um, so, not everybody needs it. We're talking 70 to 75 uh, percent. So there are still going to be jobs that will get you into the middle class that don't require some post-secondary education. But I think most of the parents in our community would say, I want my kid to be, be in, in that successful measure. Um, so we're just talking about post-secondary education. Does this mean a kid is successful? No, we're kind of limited on that. We can go out 10 or 15 years and look at all of our graduates and say, yep, they're successful. And what is that measure of success? Not living in your parents' basement when you're 25 years old. Uh, everybody would have a little bit different measure of success. So this is just one other measure of success. The yellow is our graduation rate. <clears throat> the pink there is our uh, post-secondary success. Really, um, that doesn't include our dropouts. The blue includes our dropouts. So in the class of 2013, all of our kids graduated. 50% of those were successful two years out. They were still continuing on with some sort of post-secondary education. They got a degree or they got some sort of certificate, a welding certificate, construction, uh, nursing, something like that. Uh, this class of 2014, the difference between those is this blue bar can, uh, includes those dropouts. So if we have 100 kids in that class, 58 of them were successful two years out. And we had you know, five of them not graduate high school. Um, so looking at all that data, our, the blue mark there is important. That's our five-year average for effective rate. So that's basically saying out of every kid that attended St. John High School, 49% of them are successful two years out post-secondary education. Now, does that mean that person is going to be successful? Does that mean that we have some in that that are not in that 49% that are now successful? It doesn't mean that at all. Um, there's one business owner in town that didn't get a certificate or a degree and is very successful. So we're just talking about successful post-secondary education. Um, <clears throat> how is that data? How does it compare to other schools? How does it compare to what we should be doing? <clears throat> well, it's not fair to compare us to Andover High School or Blue Valley Northwest High School. Our clientele is different. Our community makeup is different. Um, so when we look at our community makeup and our student population in that light blue there, uh, that's basically our expected rate. So in that 44 to 48 percent range is what most schools that look like us, how they would be performing. So it's, it's a little above that norm, but if my kid's going to St. John High School and you tell me he's only got a 50% chance of being successful in post-secondary, that's not good enough. That's what we need to move the needle on. Changing state assessment scores is not going to necessarily move that needle. It might help, but there's a lot of other things that we need to do, um, which might include redesigning our high school a little bit. We're having conversations about math. Do, does every kid need to have Algebra 1 to be successful? Well, maybe we need to look at that. Um, do we need to have every kid taking computer applications? I don't know. We've got kids that are skipping some classes because uh, they, they need to get what we require of them. And uh, there's some kids that probably can do the senior work release because they need to get more credits. And uh, are there situations where maybe it makes more sense for that kid to to, to get a job and get in the workforce and learn those skills rather than taking that, that other graduation credit. So that's our accreditation process. I don't have answers for you, but that's what my challenge is to the staff. If we're looking at goals for improvement, it's got to be something that moves that needle. Um, and GPA, ACT, state assessment scores aren't going to, that's not just going to do it. I'm going to add something that I forgot to mention. Our ACT scores as a school will most likely drop when we start testing every student. Just be prepared for that. That's just goes from testing, you know, 
half of the students to test in all of them. That's just something we can expect to see. So when, when Josh talks about uh, ACT scores going up, uh, comparing one school to another might be dependent on who they test. Okay. Um, any quick questions on that? <clears throat> Dan, we've kind of been over it. If you compare our data to Stafford's, Stafford's is awful. Why is that? Well, they have a lot of, uh, they have a learning center and they have a lot of students that are part of that learning center. Well, these are people that have dropped out of school and come back when they're adults. The graduation rate for, for those people, they weren't successful in school before, but they're going to try it again. Um, the graduation rate for that population is terrible. Well, that drags their data down. So it's not fair to say our data is a lot better than theirs, um, even though it, it looks a lot better. Uh, Kiowa County is the same thing. They have a huge learning center, uh, online learning, and that drags their data down. So uh, you can compare some. And, uh, but anyway, moving on. Uh, our, uh, looking at our counselor position, I don't have this as a bullet, but just to give you all a heads up, um, <clears throat> uh, we share a counselor with Stafford for elementary. They've been considering hiring a full-time counselor. So that would put us in the position of we either need to do the same or um, just be able to hire a part-time counselor. Well, that's very difficult. So we've been discussing what if we did have a full-time position. Um, our nurse position is being cut back. Um, so there is some wiggle room in, uh, in positions um, to maybe have a full-time K-12 social-emotional counselor and Mrs. Hacker could focus more on the scheduling and the guidance counseling and scholarships and those things. So um, <clears throat> I'm not making a recommendation now. I just want to report to you all that something we're, we're looking at doing. So. Um, <clears throat> school finance, I'll be very brief on this. Um, I've got a PowerPoint here for you. You've got it there if you, if you need to refer to it. <clears throat> Recall that we had our, the Supreme Court issued a ruling on the, the new state school finance formula. Um, the state invested a lot more money uh, from this year than the next four years, so a five-year plan. Um, and the Supreme Court said that that's almost right, but not quite. Um, why, why is that? Um, and it just comes down to, I won't read all this to you, but it comes down to inflation. The state figured how, how do we get to this point to say, okay, here's our number, this is what we believe is adequate for school finance, and they agreed with those figures, but they didn't, they didn't project that into the, next, into the future of the plan in the next four years. So the Supreme Court said, that's right, but the next four years, any of those increases are eaten up by inflation, so you need to adjust for that. So how did they figure that? <clears throat> The state looked at really the bottom line is what you need to see. This year and then the next four years, that's how much more was being invested into public education in the state. So those, that's the plan, that's current law. <clears throat> they went back and figured, okay, so what, how would we figure inflation in the future? We're just making a guess. Well, look at past data. So they came up with 1.44%. Um, so using current data, current expenditures, or state aid to get to this target. So ultimately, in the, in the fifth year of the plan, it needs to be about $3.7 million. Okay? So taking that target number, that $3.7 billion, where are we at this year? That's what the red is. Last year, plus the planned increase for this year, as our starting point, what's left? What, what do they need to add to the public education over the next four years? That's about $779 million. So again, we get the total $779 in the top right hand. Just average that over the next four years. This is what's already in the current law for funding increases. That difference is about, about $90 million a year, roughly. So total increase needed to meet the Supreme Court's uh, adequacy test would be about $360 million over the course of the next four years. How, would, how on earth would the state pay for that? 
Uh, this current fiscal year, um, the state has pulled in $300 million more than they budgeted. So it's easy to make up that $92 million increase in year one with funds that are already there. <coughs> Um, it seems very simple to do. Um, there's been cuts in higher education, social services, transportation that are all vying for any extra dollars to get them back up to speed as well. So <clears throat> it seems very simple to take the current law, tweak it for inflation. Um, I'm almost certain that that would pass the muster in the Supreme Court. We'd be done with school finance lawsuit for the foreseeable future. I did see a tweet right before a meeting that said uh, House and Senate leadership are strongly considering starting from ground zero to rewrite the school finance formula. Uh, so you're this close, and now we want to start over. Um, so there's that. I don't know what will happen with that, but uh, it, it makes complete sense in my mind um, to just continue on that path. I won't go all the through the rest of this with you, but you shut it down. Any quick questions on that? It'll be a political battle, and uh, it's not just schools begging for more money every year, but uh, uh, one more thing, where does that put us, I guess? This next year's state aid, base state aid would be at 4,300. 2008, 2009 was 4,400. 10 years ago, was a hundred more than that. So that's how far we've fallen and we're climbing back. So um, next year, if it would go to the recommended amount, adjusting for inflation, that would mean an additional $80,000 for us. Actually, an additional 120 above this year. 40 is already planned, so it could uh, make a significant difference for, for maybe <clears throat> at some point getting our Kansas teachers above the 42nd in the nation, is that where we're at now? On teacher pay. So that's an update on our school finance situation. Our Education Foundation, um, you, you know our, our funds are invested with South Central Community Foundation. They've hired a, uh, a, a management firm, Greystone Consulting out of Wichita, uh, to help manage their funds. I think they're about 18 million uh, right now. So they've gotten to that point where they really need some outside help. Somebody's looking at it every day. It won't really affect us at all, um, but there is somebody looking at those investments a little closer now. Um, and, uh, track uniforms, uh, we did not have on the, the list for rotation, but somehow we missed several years of that. Um, and the list that Mr. Olive had worked up had it a couple years out, but we really need to replace those. We're looking at about $3,600 for those, so I've got a quote um, uh, to replace those high school track uniforms. And uh, <clears throat> high jump pit uh, is in desperate need of replacement um, because it's in very bad repair and also it's at the dump. <laughs> so it's gone. <laughs> it's gone. <clears throat> yes, it was done. Uh, so that that was planned in our capital improvements uh, plan anyway. Um, so I got a bid for that at sixty one hundred dollars, including the top pad and the cover. Um, we work with BSN Sports. Uh, we get rewards for those things, but I, it is important to check. So I had seventy three hundred dollars and ninety five hundred dollars for bids on that that same that same. Uh, I jump pit. So. Any questions about those two large purchases? I go move forward with those. Uh, January second, we have teacher work day. Um, in the past years, we've allowed the teachers to work from any location and any time during that break. Um, they don't need to report to the building. So, if you all are okay with that, we'll continue with that process. Most of our, uh, they still have to get their grades done. They still have to get everything done. So. <clears throat> That's the expectation. Um, things not on the list here. Our classroom doors are set to be <clears throat> officially replaced over Christmas break. They should have the new ones in. It's been a disaster with the glass and our redneck fix for the windows. We did get the windows in. 
they're glass instead of two by fours and two by sixes now. Um, uh, so we're we're in decent shape right now and should be finalized over Christmas break. Uh, Kansas Open Meetings Act. Uh, just a reminder: uh, there was a, a district in our area that <coughs> had a violation, two violations. We're going into executive session and discussing business. It should not be an executive session. Uh, one was to purchase a vehicle. Uh, there's an exception in the Open Meetings Act, the fact that we can go into executive session to discuss acquisition of real property. A vehicle is not real property, it's personal property, so that's not allowed. Um, and uh, they discussed a lease of property uh, with another entity and a lease is not considered acquisition of property. So um, just a reminder that uh, each board member had to pay $25. They got fined $25 for uh, each of those violations. So they had to pay $50 out of their own pocket uh, for those violations. So uh, just something to keep in mind that it is important with that executive session matters that, that we do what we're supposed to do there. So just a good reminder. And your clerk is supposed to keep you on, on top of that. <laughs> I'm not in executive session either. <laughs> Still doing anything wrong. <laughs> no, that's all I have on my list. All right. Thank you, Mr. Barr. Yep. Um, <clears throat> any executive session items tonight? I did. Uh, we have some new students that I wanted to be able to answer questions that the board had them, but. If, if there are questions, we need to do that in the executive session. So you all can tell me if you need uh, questions answered. Would anybody like to go in the executive session? Have there been any, any reasons for our staff to have more information? No. Okay. Carl? No. All right, we're good. Okay. All right. Uh, so no executive session item tonight. Boy, they picked a good night to come. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, we'll move on to closing business items. Uh, any resignations or contracts? Uh, future agenda items? Uh, you have those there. Uh, my contract, and uh, we had two items that we discussed last month that. I've had no progress on and that's a potential purchase of real property and uh, uh, maybe changing up our, how we purchase our fuel and look at the uh, principal contract and uh, we may have some discussion about future negotiations. I'm not sure what we'll be doing that. Okay. Anything else before the board? Anything for adjournment? So moved. Second. We adjourn. All in favor, aye. Bush carried six zero. We are adjourned. And you guys are. Really